Coming up, the hydraulic pump saps nearly all my strength. I lose all ability to speak. Uh, one thing I should mention, I actually, uh, that, yeah, I picked up the, uh, for fuck's sake. And I nearly lose my knuckles. <sighs> I'm not gonna lie, that hurt a lot. <laughs> okay, so it's a fresh new day and the job that I was basically tackling there a few minutes ago was the removal of the PS pump. So I know I said in the previous episode that I have pretty much everything that I want to remove removed. That is mostly true, um, but I didn't actually fully intend to remove this PS pump. Um, but I just realized that to replace this engine mount and to get a bit better access to kind of all these grubbier parts I was gonna to have to remove the pumps. So power steering pump basically sat here. There's a gasket here uh, Two of the oil lines from the oil filter reservoir uh, basically came straight through the bracket that held the PS pump in place Which I'll just show you here now So that's it there I get all this cleaned up. I'm gonna start replacing these engine mounts next both the left and the right side and then I can move on to more important bits. Right, so I just finished cleaning up this entire area here on the front left of the engine. It looks so much cleaner as you can see. And I also removed this perished oil hose as well, so it allowed me to clean behind uh, that connection and this whole general area. So it looks way, way better. Um, the engine mounts right so this is the left side engine mount and to think that I actually wasn't really going to replace these I just ordered them just you know from a point of completeness essentially um, but take a look at this I've got the jack underneath here with a few blocks of wood and just keep an eye here on the en engine mount here as I jack it up look at that just separates into two pieces it's absolutely destroyed completely gone and just to show you what a brand new one looks like these are um, cortical mounts and it is just an absolute brick as you can see it's one solid lump and as you can see it should not be in two separate pieces and um, so I'm gonna get these in and it should make a world of difference That's the bottom screw removed. And I'm going to slide the new one in. Nice. Well, that went in nice and easily, and this is the destroyed mount. It's basically in two pieces, as you can see. And what I noticed straight away is, once the mount's actually installed, is the sheer height difference as well. So this is basically collapsed on itself. As you can see, if you compare the two side by side, I can't really do it here. But the right hand side one is way, way taller. And with just uh, the left side one installed, the engine is actually lopsided. You can't actually see it, but this side is actually considerably higher than it is on this side. So uh, I'm going to get the nuts put back on here and I'll start on the right side one. I'll just give you a quick look as well on the underside of the car, just to show you the underside of the actual engine mount. So you can see there's the actual thread there for the nut and you have a locator stud there as well. So where's my torch? Basically the mount will only install one way. 
So you can see there, that's the actual locator stud right beside the nut. So that's all tightened up the spec and I can start on the right side now. Right, so this right side mount went in no problem at all. We have a brand new mount and the engine is now level again. Just putting the nut back on there, I'll tighten that up. But yeah, it's nice and straight now, nice and flat. And the right side mount actually wasn't too bad. So it's still fairly intact, but it's fairly beaten up as well. But it's kind of crazy the way one side is way worse than the other. Not sure why that is, but uh, definitely worth replacing in pairs anyway. So this is the hydraulic pump on the E31, and it's quite an interesting pump in that it provides both hydraulic pressure to the power steering system and to the braking system. So it's kind of like a dual purpose pump. And the objective here is to remove the pump from the actual engine mount bracket so that I can get the pump opened up and replace all the seals inside. Now there is no visible evidence of any kind of leakage or damage or anything like that with the pump, but there's absolutely no doubt that all the seals inside are 30 years old. So it makes perfect sense to replace them at this point. That is one clean power steering pump. As you can see, it's a ZF unit. And it's much, much cleaner. And will make taking it apart a lot easier as well. Okay, so my gasket set has arrived from BMW and um, this kit basically comprises every seal and o-ring that you're going to find inside these tandem vein pumps. Um, so I'll just show you what you get inside it. So there's a variety of seals and gaskets inside this kit. Um, you basically get two of these kind of odd shaped gaskets, as you can see. Uh, you get these two o-rings as well, which I think are actually for the pistons. The pistons are located underneath these large uh, Phillips heads. You can basically see them moving left and right. So I'm pretty sure those O-rings go in there. Uh, and then we have um, uh, this side, that's an O-ring there obviously. <clears throat> and there's a front uh, oil seal as well, it's located in here. So uh, all these parts need to be replaced and they better get to it. Okay, so there's a small amount of metal filings here. But everything else looks good. Okay, so this is the large o-ring, so I presume that goes on the outside. It does. And this gasket will sit there. That looks good. So 
that's those two. I'd imagine this one here goes on here. That's the same size as that. So that's three. Then we have this other gasket, which I imagine is possibly mirrored on the opposite side of this part. So that's probably where that goes. And then we have two more O-rings here as well, which more than likely belong, as I mentioned previously, to the pistons. Which just leaves this, which I believe is the main oil seal, which basically sits on this axle. Um, which I can't actually see, but I'd imagine it probably sits in there somewhere. So that's going to be fun to get apart because this axle actually needs to be pressed out. I don't actually have a press or a puller. Um, yeah, so it needs to be pulled out and the press back in. So I'm going to have to sort that out later. Okay, so I'm just going to sort this end of the pump out first. This piece here should come off. And we have an arrow here. This arrow is pointing the same way as this arrow. And I'll replace this O-ring here. So yeah, this is the largest O-ring in the kit. So I'm just going to replace this one now. Going to apply some of the actual fluid to it. Okay, so my new o ring goes in. Now we have this o ring as well. Which is more of a gasket, really. Which is rock solid. Oh, okay. So it's actually comprised of two gaskets. Um. Yeah, so this forms the outer section of the seal, and then the black one forms the inner section of the seal. So I was wondering where the brown gasket actually went when I saw it in the kit. And now I know. Okay, now the hard gasket needs to go in. And by the looks of things, it should just press in. Which it does. Well, that was surprisingly easy. Great, so that's three of the seals done. I can put these over in my used pile. And then we have four seals left. And um, yeah, so let's get to it. Okay, so I have the pump in a bench vise and bear with me here, because this may seem crazy, but what I'm doing is I'm removing um, this cap, which basically gives you access to the piston and to the spring. There's another piston and spring on the opposite side, and the goal is to replace this O-ring, which has basically turned to plastic, and it's completely flattened out as well. So what I mean by bear with me is, wait until you see the amount of force that is required to remove this cap. So I'm gonna reinstall this one with the old O-ring until I can get the other one out on the opposite side. But this is just insane. 
And a big thank you and shout out to Lawrence on the E31 Facebook group for pointing me in the right direction because I'd all but given up on these, trying to actually get the pistons out because I just thought there was no way in hell you have to hit them that hard to get these caps off. So as you can see, they've got a big kind of Phillips head on the top, which is just way too big for any kind of regular, even flathead screwdriver. So the only way to get this off is to whack the hell out of it. And um, even if you had the correct screwdriver, there's no way you get enough torque to undo it. So you literally just have to whack them. Now I have, I've had these soaking in penetrating oil. I've been heating them earlier on today. I've been whacking the hell out of it and still it will not budge. But hopefully this one, having seen how the other one comes off, will actually come off. Uh, well, I won't say just as easily, but uh, that's the old o-ring just in case you're wondering about that So you just have to whack the hell out of this. Let's give this another go There we go. Ta-da! Okay, so there you can actually see both of the pistons. And you've got these caps either side. And as you can see, as the actual shaft rotates, the pistons move in and out because of this eccentric uh, piece that's actually on the shaft. So I should now be able to remove the pistons. And there is another rock hard O-ring. So I'm gonna keep these uh, each side corresponding. I wanna make sure I put the same parts back in basically. So this set on the left side, I'm gonna put it back in on the tissue side. And then the non-tissue side, I'm gonna keep these parts over on the right hand side. And that's that piston. Off comes that old O-ring. And these are my new piston O-rings. I have a new seal for here. And then that's the male main oil seal. So that brings me on to the next thing that I want to do is remove this flange. And removing this flange will allow me to remove the shaft this way. And I should be able to just below you can't actually see it, but just below there's a washer in here. Just below that washer is this main seal. That's the main seal there. So let's get at it. So to do that, I'm going to have to pull this flange off with a puller. Okay, that's fairly uniform. Right, I'm just gonna stop the video there for very good reason. Well, an exceptionally bad reason. It's a full two weeks later from what you're just after seeing me trying to pull the flange off the actual shaft itself. And the reason it's two weeks later is because I snapped the flange. Um, so as you saw, I was kind of pulling on all three corners of the flange. Um, maybe I should have been pulling on the flats, but uh, I was pulling, 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 and unbeknownst to me, this was bending, 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 um, and it snapped clean off. Now when that happened, I was just like, walked away from the car, turned the lights off, didn't look at it for several days. It just annoyed the hell out of me. Um, so I looked into getting a replacement flange, obviously it doesn't exist, pointless. So I brought it to my local machine shop. And what he did was, because this is a cast iron piece, it's quite um, a brittle material, um, but they can brace it, basically braze it back together, which is a form of welding for cast iron. So he basically just cut a V in the actual brake um, and then brazed it back together. Now, as I say, there was still a tremendous bend in the actual flange, so he basically stuck it on a lathe and milled it away and flattened it off, and it did the same on the back side as well, so it's now perfectly weighted and uh, symmetrical as well, so last thing I wanted was any kind of wobble in the pulley, so um, just an absolute disaster, but it's back on now. Um, I'm after, I actually freeze or froze the shaft, and I heated up the flange, and I whacked it back on, and now it's back on in the exact same position, uh, with the same amount of play as beforehand so uh, and i'll show you now how i did that
Huh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There we go. So this is the new one with the same markings on it. This is also a staff apart, or sorry, staff apart. Just gonna put a small bit of fluid in here. And I'm just gonna tap in this new, actually maybe we'll just press in. Hmm. That looks pretty good. Okay, so I've had the shaft in the freezer for a bit two hours now, just trying to make it microscopically smaller, just so it might make it that bit easier to get the flange back on. So I'm reinserting it now. That's it installed back on top. And I'm going to heat up the actual flange now and see if I can get it pressed back on. Okay, so now that I have the flange back on the shaft, I can proceed to reinstalling my pistons. Uh, so this is my tissue side, which had the left side piston. And this is the piston here. Actually, at this point, I should probably point out, I'm after, so this is the actual hydraulic oil or reservoir uh, filler cap. Um, and CHF 7.1 is the fluid that should be used in this particular model. This is a, a 1991 uh, 850. So. Um, this is the Febby fluid I'm after picking up, and this is commonly used by everybody now. Um, so Febby actually meets the spec of the original oil, which is actually now quite hard to get. Um, so this is the fluid that I'm going to be using, and I'll use this to lubricate the parts as I'm actually reinstalling it. So that piston can go back in. I'm just going to dip everything in the fluid as I reinstall it. I'm going to reinstall my new O-rings. They also get a dip in the fluid. I'll just make sure the caps are clean. I'm going to stretch the O-ring over the treads and then reinstall the cap. Alright, so there you can see the eccentric section of the shaft pushing the pistons left and right. That sounds very smooth. Okay, so you can see me backtracking here already. I forgot to install these two rings which basically sit over the shaft. I can just press that back into place. There we go. And I can reinstall the caps again. And that just leaves the final part to be installed, which is this stainless steel washer. That just sits on the shaft like that. Fantastic. Okay, so now I can just focus on getting this end of the pump back together and I get the whole thing reassembled. I just make sure there's no little bits of grit or dirt inside the pump. Just gonna apply some fluid. Now I can reinstall all the bolts. Okay, let's just clean up this o-ring recess here a bit better. That looks a lot better. Okay, down to the last o-ring here now. That should sit on there. And I should seal the main section of the pump against it.
Ta-da! Oh, that was pretty straightforward. And it just needs to be centered. And surely this belongs to this one. That's three. Alright, so this is my pump bracket. Now that I have the pump fully refurbished, I'll be able to slide it back in and bolt it all up. But I just want to clean this up a bit before it goes back on the engine. But overall I would say that is a 99% successful <laughs> hydraulic pump refurbishment. She's all back together, all new seals, and should be good for another 130,000 miles. Okay, so a quick forewarning in regards what you're about to witness here, which is me basically refurbing this kind of whole back left section of the engine bay. Uh, you have a whole myriad of parts here, heater valve, uh, brake booster, there's a hydraulic pump nestled all the way down the bottom there, auxiliary water pump. And this whole section of the engine was just a nightmare to work on. And the thoughts of coming home uh, from work after a long day and then working on this mess uh, was very off-putting. It's the main reason why in the last six weeks I haven't really done any work on the car or any kind of major work. Um, main reason being you've got so many hydraulic lines in there. You've got all the coolant lines. A lot of the connections were seized. Just getting tools in here was an absolute nightmare and just very uncomfortable trying to remember where everything goes because everything has a very specific order in which it needs to be connected and reconnected. Um, so very off-putting, not something anybody wants to come home to. Um, but I have it all done. Uh, here's the footage now. You may find it tedious, you may find it interesting. Um, yeah, but let me know in the comments. Okay, so I'm about to tackle all of these coolant hoses at the back of the engine. And um, two of these hoses actually come from this, the heater valve. And uh, basically one of them squirrels all the way down and it enters the coolant tube on the back of the engine and the other one actually enters here into the firewall. So I'm going to try and get these disconnected. I've already undone one of these hose clamps and now I'll just undo the other one here at the back of the firewall as well. <laughs> okay, hose clamp just went flying. Okay, so just to give you a better view of what I can actually see here at the back of the engine, uh, you can see the three coolant lines there entering the firewall, and uh, they lead into the heater core, and you can see the line below it, which is basically a center uh, coolant channel that runs across the back of the engine, uh, and the larger uh, coolant hose connected to that. So you can see below it here, all this stuff here, that's the actual sound deadening on the firewall. It's all cracked and um, not in the best of condition, but it's actually not the worst. Um, I pressed on it with my fingers and it's not falling apart or anything like that, so I think I'll just leave that be. There's also a brake line embedded actually in the um, sound dead in there, which you can see um, uh, comes from uh, this whole hydraulic area here underneath and then runs across the back. Um, so now would also be a good time as well to replace these are the two main uh, fuel supplies and some rubber hoses down there. Yeah, that's the rubber hoses here. Now would be a good time to replace them while I have the actual heater valve out of the way. And I'm going to have to figure out some way of uh, attaching the actual auxiliary water pump, which basically should be sitting here. But like I mentioned previously, someone has done a auxiliary water pump delete and they basically removed it. Um, now ordinarily, if I can grab the actual heater valve, that's it there. Um, as far as I'm aware, just below the power connector, there should be like a large kind of hose clamp. I think, see those two holes there? I think they've got something to do with it. Uh, and that basically clamps uh, the water pump just below it. Um, but as you can see, there it's completely missing. So I'm going to have to find uh, some kind of way of jerry-rigging or getting my own, my own hose clamp or like a large uh, plastic zip tie and actually uh, zip locking it in place, basically. So, so I have to get started on all that. And I think the next thing to do is 
find all four of these hoses uh, in my parts and get the new ones out here. Hopefully that one's loose enough. The rubber is essentially welded onto the actual metal pipe. I'm not gonna lie, that hurt a lot. Right, so that's the first bit of hose cut. So here is my old hose. As you can see, the markings are still on it. The original BMW 8x13, so 8mm is the internal diameter. And then 13 is the external diameter. And this is my new hose, which is the exact same spec. This is original BMW hose. And that's the first length cut. Just cut it with a regular standing knife. And I can now attach it onto the actual fuel line. Ah, that's it. One last push. That's it fully seated. Two new fuel lines. Okay, so I'm after getting two new hydraulic lines, as you can see here, the combination of uh, rubber and solid line. And both of those lines correspond to these two lines here, which are in bad shape. And there was evidence of leakage on them before. But as you can see, the rear end of these lines goes all the way in underneath here. And there's virtually no access. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to get a spanner in there to get them undone. So I'm going to remove the master cylinder here. And uh, the brake reservoir sits on top of there. And ordinarily, I'll just disconnect both these lines, these two bolts, um, and then hopefully it comes straight out and gives me better access to replacing these lines. There we go. Hmm, cruddy. Otherwise looks in very good condition. Okay, so I have the lower section of the uh, brake fluid reservoir removed, or the front of the brake booster essentially, but it's still not giving me enough access to these two lines underneath, which I need to replace. Um, I can get at one of the nuts, but it seems to be rounding out already, which is not what I want. So I may have to remove this entire um, ASC unit, which is a bit of a torture because the two mounts that are mounted below it, uh, so it's basically a front mount. You can actually see see this uh, black stud here. Um, I think there's actually, yeah, there's one of them. There's two at the front and there's one at the back. They actually correspond to these bolts down here in the wheel well. As you can see there, there's two at the front and one at the back. So I'm going to try removing the three of them. That should loosen up the entire unit. And then hopefully I can just uh, detach all those lines on the top get the unit out and that should give me much better access to replacing those two lines which plug into the underside of it so this is turning into a much bigger job but I've got the two lines and those rubber hoses they are not in the best of condition and they need to be replaced so let's get started okay so I've got everything loose Apart from this front bracket, which I've just undone from inside the wheel well. Hopefully this comes off easily enough. And it is. So these screws go straight through the body into the wheel well and they've got two nuts on each end. Now that, that bracket's out, I'm hoping I can get this out of the way. Okay, so I've just spotted that all these lines will actually move out of the way. 
without bending, which is good. So I don't actually have to remove these. job okay so finally got the hydro unit out as you can see and this now gives me an opportunity to show you just where it was sitting right here at the back left of the engine bay all these holes represent where the actual uh, mounting brackets were and you can still see there's evidence of leakage and seepage around this area and in fairness i was actually spraying some degreasing spray and the whole lot in here trying to clean it up so that's why it's still a bit wet um, yeah, all these lines just get in the way, but the fact that you can bend them out of the way um, allowed me to finally get it out. Um, so that's basically where it's sat. And you can see the two big uh, power connectors here as well. That's one uh, and there as well. So you have to uh, activate the slider on it just to get those units off. Again, well in situ, it's a bloody nightmare. Um, but yeah, now that I have it out, you can actually see what I was trying to do. So these are the connections on the underside and trying to get these off while the unit's in situ is just impossible. These are actually facing downwards towards the ground so the unit sits like that. So there's no way they are coming off and as you can see I started actually trying to um, remove that inner one there and I actually wrung it out so um, well it's only a small bit wrung out I'd say once I get the spanner on in a different position it will come out but um, yeah both of these lines have to be replaced and the only reason I'm replacing them is because of these rubber ends. Uh, it's very unlikely that these leak because normally they're actually very solid connections but these were leaking at this end um, so they need to be replaced uh, and these are the original replacements here uh, that's one of them and that's the other so nice brand new lines and some new rubber on them as well so I'm going to get this cleaned up and I'm going to get it back in the car Okay, so the one with the bend in it goes in the middle hole. The right angle goes on the outer hole. Bend middle hole. new lines done and done okay so I have the two new lines on the underside finally attached and the whole unit is nice and cleaned up 
not that it needs to be cleaned up, but it's always nice to have it nice and clean so I can see any future leaks, anything like that. Um, so now it's going to be fun getting this back into the car. But I have this whole area now cleaned up, as you can see. Way, way cleaner uh, than it was beforehand. Um, this looks like rust here, but it's not at all. It's actually the adhesive they use. You can see it here as well um, to actually seal the body panels together. And then it's just uh, a base coat sprayed over it. So that's all that is. It's actually a brown color. Um, so much cleaner in there. I'm actually going to tighten down on these hose clamps and then the two that are further in. And then I'm going to try and squeeze this unit back in. Hmm, not looking forward to this. <laughs> How did this come out? Uh -huh. That feels good. <laughs> So now all that's left to do is get all these hooked up and get the brackets um, that are actually mounted onto the body screwed back together. It should be ready to go. Okay, here I'm using my trusty paintbrush to actually bend the brake line to the left as you're looking at it. And that allows me to screw this straight down. If you can see if I release the tension, absolutely no way that nut's going in. But as soon as you bend it away and straighten up the pipe, I can start turning it again. Paintbrush saves the day again. I just spent a bit of time cleaning up the master cylinder. As you can see, this is an original ATE branded part with the BMW stamp as well. So it's all cleaned up. It can go straight back into the car. Rock solid. Done. Okay, so this is the heater valve from the car. As you can see, it's comprised of two separate valves. And this is what actually determines uh, whether coolant is allowed to enter into the heater core or not inside the actual car and provide heat uh, depending on demand of the actual dials inside the car. So I want to make sure this is working before I put it back into the car. And each uh, independent valve is controlled by this left and right side pin. So you've got the center pin, 12 volts is supplied to that. And depending on whether ground is uh, connected to this left pin or the right pin, that dictates whether the left or the right valve is open. Uh, so the way that you check that um, is I've got my PC power supply here. And I'm just going to very crudely apply 12 volts to each of the pins. So 12 volt is applied to the center pin. So I'm going to do the right one first. This right pin corresponds to the right valve. And when I supply 12 volts between the two pins, you should hear a very obvious clicking noise, which would indicate that the valve is working. So yes, perfect. The right side one is good. And I'll just try the left side one. And that one's working fine as well. And then the right side, left side. Great. So this is in good condition. And I can start replacing all these hoses and get it back into the car. Okay, so now that I have everything here sorted, I can now get my heater valve back in and all my coolant hoses. And I have all my replacement hoses here, and these all have to be replaced. So again, this is the heater valve here. And I think I mentioned in one of my previous videos that the auxiliary water pump, uh, the previous owner or maybe somebody before him, actually deleted this. So this isn't actually in the car. This is the new one from the BMW dealer, which uh, is actually a hell apart. Um, 
So this was missing entirely from uh, my vehicle. So what a lot of people do is whenever that unit fails, they don't bother replacing it and they'll just bypass it by putting this different hose on it. Um, and that hose basically leads straight into the coolant channel on the back of the engine. So what the auxiliary water pump does, and the reason that people delete it is it's an unnecessary expense. It doesn't have any real function for the engine other than you can basically have your heater system running while the engine is turned off, say, as it says in the BMW manual, you're sitting at some crossroads or something like that. You can have the engine turned off and this auxiliary water pump will circulate coolant around the engine through the heater core and allow you to have the heating on whilst the engine isn't. Um, so ordinarily, this heater pump would be mounted here with a big uh, hose clamp. And instead of this longer pipe here, this is the actual factory part. So this basically sits here. The coolant goes from the heater valve into the actual auxiliary water pump and then you have the outlet here and that basically leads into that same channel here. So I'm going to have to pull this off entirely and figure out some way to jerry-rig this onto the side of the heater valve because they don't actually make the screw and hose clamp uh, anymore for it. So I'm going to have to zip tie it into place somehow. Um, so this gets plugged in. It's obviously an electronic pump and I'm going to have to ditch this new hoses again like I say all these hoses are going on I've got used hose clamps as well these are all dealer hose clamps and once I have all of these replaced which I can just show you here briefly so this is the leftmost hose so as you can see that one matches that one this one matches this one and funnily enough this one here okay this one leads from the rear you can actually see it at the moment ordinarily you'd have the hard uh, metal coolant pipe going down the center of the V and this actually connects to that pipe and plugs into the firewall so I do have a replacement one of these but strangely enough and I do have the correct part number this is it um, it's a much longer hose but as per BMW's instructions, you basically cut that uh, hose to size. I'm not sure if this does both the V8 and the V12, and perhaps in the V8 it retains its entire length, but for the V12, you basically have to cut it to size. Um, so that's what I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna get started now. Okay, so I've spent a bit of time just trying to figure out what the correct orientation of this kind of U-bend uh, coolant pipe is. It seems you can basically have it on either way round. Um, now there, was a, uh, there is a white stamp on it here. I'm just wondering if that has something to do with, you know, is that a hot side or a pump side or something? I'm not too sure. But with the white square on this pump side, it seems to me that this is uh, the correct orientation of it. Again, even if it's wrong, I don't even think it matters. Um, so I have put my hose clamps on there at the moment. And if you put this at a slight angle, that's essentially where, now I have a funny feeling that the pump actually probably sat out a little bit because of the clamp system that was probably in place. Um, 
and then that's kind of the top view of it so even if this end is on here and this end is here it makes no difference it basically almost looks identical um, so what I'm going to try to do is tighten them up the hose clamps and I'm going to try and uh, basically cable tie this onto the actual main uh, valve assembly um, I actually have a little bit of um, damping material here so I might try and actually just put that in between it as well um, and yeah so let's give this a go and see how it turns out No, oh, that's actually pretty solid already. It's a little bit of wobble in it. Hopefully the pliers will tighten things up. So yeah, that doesn't exactly look factory or normal, but it, it basically saves the pump from buzzing against the actual heater valve. Um, not that you're probably gonna be able to hear it or the actual sound of the engine, but um, it does no harm to have it there either. So that's pretty solid. I'll try and get these torqued down and we can go from there. I just did a test fit of the whole unit on the car and this hose clamp is actually getting in the way so it needs to be rotated downwards. The actual screw assembly needs to be underneath like that. Okay, so that's all the hoses attached. Um, the only one left to replace is this one here. So this one here came off the auxiliary water pump and that connects to the rear coolant line on the back of the engine. These came as a set of two for some reason. I'm not sure why. I, well, I possibly ordered two by accident. Uh, I can't be sure. But I will attach this now to the pump and this will be the last hose. That's it finished. It's pretty elaborate, but every single line has been now replaced and I now have a working auxiliary water pump. Okay, so let's get this back in the car. There's only actually two power connectors on this. Uh, you've got the actual power harness for the heater valve and you have the power connection for the auxiliary water pump. So I need to fold them out of the way and we have another connector here that was for the temp sensor, I think, on the intake manifold. I just temporarily put that out of harm's way. And this should slip back into position. Put that one down there. Make sure not to bend these wires. Okay. Now there is two rubber mounts here that are broken, so I'll have to replace them at a later date. Uh, is there anything else stopping these from going in? So this is the middle one. This is the leftmost one. So that's the passenger side. So that one will go there. That one will go there. I might as well push these on now, actually. If we can. Is that all the way on? Is. Okay, that's pretty tight. And then what else have we got here? So is this actually in position? It is. Okay, so one of the rubber mounts here is actually still intact. You probably can't see that. But that's ordinary, that's where that would be. We've got one acorn not left. That's the only thing that's actually holding this on at the moment. Like I say, ordinarily you'd have two more there. And we've got the lower hose here, of course, needs to go back on. And there's no hose clamp on that, so we'll do that now. Okay, that's on nice and tight. So 
I'll just tighten these ones down and I'll be all done. That's it. I swear to God, if I see another hose clamp, I need to plug these back in. So, that goes in there. What a nice click. And uh, so this is the heater valve. Also, what a nice click. Now we're done. Okay, and to finally finish this job off, I am after cutting my full length uh, coolant hose in two. And this pretty much matches um, the existing one here. So uh, it's not quite the same shape, but it is uh, the same length and it'll do the job just fine, just like the original. And that's going to sit in here. I can slide it in and it's gonna connect onto this coolant pipe here going into the firewall. So again, everything's really tight and hard to get into position. But with a little bit of jiggling, there we go. That's on pretty well. Just need to tighten up this hose clamp. And then this end here will connect to the small metal coolant pipe, which is here, which goes down the center of the engine. So that is the last of the hoses uh, replaced. So once I have that tightened down, I can move on to these uh, temperature sensors here in the back of the engine. So I have some replacements for these. I think there's some aluminium washers as well. Um, so they need to be replaced. And I think, yeah, once I have them in place, these in place, I can get the valve covers back on and we can start going back from there. Okay, so now that I've got pretty much everything sorted on the back left side of the engine, I can move on to replacing these temperature sensors which are located in the rear coolant channel on the back of the engine. So um, I've referred to it several times. The rear uh, coolant channel is basically this channel here. It's like a large uh, pipe uh, integral to the engine and it passes coolant from one side to the other. And uh, this temperature, the so three temperature sensors actually plug straight into that pipe. So um, each one has a different function. I think one provides temperature sensing to the actual um, uh, clock on the dash. Another one provides uh, uh, temperature information to the DME, the engine computer. And I can't remember what the third one does, but I'm going to replace all three of them. Makes sense whilst I have access here, because once the intake manifold and everything is back on, I can imagine it's a real pain to get these replaced. So they're probably fine, but again, it makes sense to do it. These are all original OEM parts. Uh, I probably massively overpaid for these, but at least I know the quality is good. But it is just a standard kind of temperature sensor. Um, and these are all the seal rings. So hopefully I can get these in and out fairly easily. Um, I've just been experimenting here with a few different uh, sockets just to see what actually works. Um, this is a 20 mil socket. And it's not a bad seal. I, hopefully that does the job. Um, otherwise I have a, a spark plug socket here which again isn't too bad hopefully that works out as well so uh, space is pretty tight in there but I say once I have the power connections removed um, I should be able to get these sockets down with an extension so yeah let's get to it so the entire ignition harness is kind of in the way Actually, that's one of the sensors there, so I might be able to get it this rightmost one from the middle of the banks. Right, so I just spotted that the leftmost sensor uh, is actually accessible from here, from the middle of the engine, so hopefully I can just lift this up out of the way. disrupt the washer <laughs> no fear of that as is welded onto it but that is the old sensor oh this is torture absolute fucking torture
Ah, oh, there it is. Right, so that's all three sensors removed. That's one of them there. Here's another. As you can see, they're pretty grotty. Not in the best of condition physically, but they probably do still work, no problem at all. But again, it's worth doing just while the engine's open to this extent and they're fairly accessible. Uh, I'll just give you an idea of where they actually sit. You can see one of the holes there clearly now as well. Um, so each uh, sensor seals with an aluminium crush washer um, and they just get torqued down uh, fairly moderately. Uh, and you can see the actual connectors there as well, just hanging loose. So let's get these new ones in. So I'm actually just going to put a small bit of silicon grease on this just to keep the o-ring in place. I'm not going to actually put it on the threads, but just on the mating surface. And even just that tiny amount alone should keep it in place. Right, that's as tight as I can get it by hand. No need to go super tight on them. And that's it. So that's the second one on. And I just need to get this last one on. It's a real pain. Done. Okay, so that about sums up another episode. I can't even tell you how good it feels to have this entire area of the engine sorted out. That stuff was just giving me nightmares. Um, so it's great to have it done. And um, my hydraulic pump's all done, so that can go straight back in. And once that goes back in, this whole area of the engine can get sorted out as well. So I can get my uh, oil filter housing back in, hydraulic uh, reservoir goes back in, and all the associated lines as well. So I've got all new lines, all new pipes, all that can go in, in the next episode. I've got my hydraulic uh, reservoir here, all nicely cleaned up. That can go back in. I still have all my, obviously, cooling parts and everything has to go back in. I just got a sand blaster as well, so I'm going to be blasting that, hopefully, in the next episode too. Uh, valve covers will go back on. Um, and, yeah, I really can't wait to hear this thing start up. It's since March, actually, is the last time I heard this engine actually start up. And we're now in mid-August, so uh, a fire has been lit under me now. I'm definitely going to get this uh, finished in the next, well, fingers crossed, four weeks or so. So stick with me. Uh, thanks for watching. And if you haven't subscribed, please do. And uh, yeah, I'll see you in the next episode.